This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, guest host Dr. Anthony Eames, director of scholarly initiatives at the Reagan Institute, speaks with Dr. Allison Prash, author of The World is Our Stage, The Global Rhetorical Presidency and the Cold War. Anthony and Allison discuss the new book and the history of American presidents and their use of rhetoric on the global stage. Welcome, my name is Anthony Eames and I am the Director of Scholarly Initiatives for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute and I am your guest host today for the Reaganism podcast featuring Dr. Allison Prash, Assistant Professor, Rhetoric, Politics and Culture, University of Wisconsin-Madison, author of this phenomenal new book, the world is our stage, global rhetorical presidency in the Cold War. Allison, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. So uh, I am, uh, have had the privilege of being one of the, I assume, the first people to, to get their hands on on this book. It just was released uh, in January. That's correct. Yeah. And, and all our listeners can track it down on Amazon or uh, the University of Chicago Press website or maybe a Barnes & Noble, I presume. Absolutely, wherever fine books are sold. Wherever fine books are sold, very good. Well, um, this is really a, a phenomenal work, kind of covering the, the entirety of the 20th century, um, but more specifically, the Cold War. Uh, and it's um, a topic that I'm a little curious about how you got into. So tell me about how you got into studying the global rhetorical presidency and what is the global rhetorical presidency? <laughs> So glad you asked that question. Um, well, let me start by explaining how I got into this topic, and then I can unpack that definition a little bit. So this may, you know, um, underscore the fact that I am a history nerd, um, but all good academics are, right? Um, but when I was in high school, actually, um, I I heard a recording of President Ronald Reagan's speech at Point de Hoc in France. And it was on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, so June 6th, 1984. And I remember as a kid, I, you know, I was taking history classes and I was aware to some extent of D-Day and, and Reagan um, as president, but the speech gripped me in a way that I could not fully account for. And I, and I don't remember the particulars, but I, I know I was hearing the speech and I also was seeing um, video footage of the address. And so for, for your listeners who have seen it, if you haven't look it up, um, but Reagan is delivering this speech um, with his back to the English channel on the cliffs of Point de Hoc. And I remember being so moved by the speech. And also I struggled to have a, a, a vocabulary to articulate exactly why it was something beyond it was emotional. It was moving. It was commemorating this, this moment in time. And so fast forward, I decided um, after my undergraduate degree to, to go to graduate school and study presidential rhetoric. And up to that point, it was really common for people in the academy to, to study presidential rhetoric and be most concerned with the words a president said. Right. So the the words that Reagan was delivering at Point de Hoc, which are beautiful and moving, and, and hopefully we can talk about those later in the podcast. Um, but what I couldn't get around is the other images that accompanied that speech. So, for example, Reagan is standing on the cliffs of Point de Hoc, which become a really important marker in his speech where something historical happened. You can hear the crash of the waves on the beachhead behind him. Members of his audience are there, not just the dignitaries, but 62 of the U.S. Army Rangers who enacted the historical event that he described. And for me, there was something about those images, those bodies, that place that I thought mattered just as much as the words that Reagan was articulating. And so that question of can these bodies, can this place, can these images, these sights and sounds and smells, these sensory dimensions of rhetoric, can they interact with the words he's saying? That was the question that motivated my graduate study. That was the question that motivated my dissertation. Um, and that's the question that really led um, to the questions that I attempt to answer in this book. And so when we think about the global rhetorical presidency, as I argue in the book, I'm really describing the number of ways that presidents 
seek to reach audiences both in the United States and around the world. So I think it's not a surprise probably today that that when a president speaks, they are speaking not just to a U.S. audience, a domestic audience, although they are, they're also addressing a global audience. And this becomes particularly important during the Cold War. Um, but when we think about the global rhetorical presidency, I'm interested not just in how presidents address publics through their language, the words that they use, but also the images that circulate of them speaking in various locations or places. I'm concerned with how and why the movement of their body beyond U.S. borders to locations overseas, what that symbolizes or what that comes to mean for foreign policy and geopolitics. Um, I'm interested in how we can understand the relationship between the words they say and the places that they say these words and how that all works together to, to persuade audiences of their particular message. Yeah. And uh, you take on the cold war because mm -hmm. the way I understand it, you know, presidential travel today is so common, so frequent president hops on air force one, you read it in the paper, oh, they're going off to Europe or they're going off to an Asian ally or they're, it's just routine. It's quotidian. It's, it's something that doesn't really raise an eyebrow. Um, that seems to really be something that emerged from this Cold War competition. But you also spend a little time saying that, that there's some presidents who predated the Cold War, who started to make travel an important part of the presidency in a way that it, it really hadn't been before. And, and maybe you could lay that out for us. Yeah, absolutely. So in the book, I, you're, you're right. I focus on, on the particular cold war context, but I really do try to set the stage for how and why this developed. So um, it is the case that Teddy Roosevelt is the first U S president to leave the United States while in office. So, so other presidents, you know, will, will travel to Europe when they're not in office, but sure. Teddy Roosevelt is the first president and he does this in 1906. He goes and he visits um, the Panama Canal zone and he makes this decision um, because he wants to shore up public support for the project in 1906. And in fact, he's facing, um, extensive criticism of the project. And so he says, you know, there's this quote from the New York Times, I'm going to go down to the ditch myself and see how the project's getting along. And he actually brings a photographer with him hmm. whose main purpose is to photograph Teddy Roosevelt in the Panama Canal Zone, brings the pictures back to Washington, D.C. They are published in the congressional record, and it's the first time images are published in the congressional record. And Roosevelt talks about how he wants the public to see what it was like down there. He wants them to physically experience this place and this commitment that the United States had to this zone through him vicariously. Um, there's a number of other, you know, trips that presidents make after Roosevelt, but probably the most significant after that is Woodrow Wilson when he makes the decision to travel to Versailles and then participate in the League of Nations. Um, the the meeting over what what he would argue for is the League of Nations, and um, Wilson actually faces immense criticism because a number of public officials, senators say, you are abdicating your role as president if you're going to be leading the country. You need to be present in Washington. How dare you leave? Now, now he's gone for, for more than a quick uh, he, weekend trip, to be clear. To be clear, he is. No, and but it actually becomes this pretty intense line of attack that, you know, you're just, you're leaving. And and if you look at the archival record and, and various historians, they talk about how, how Wilson was so desperate to be seen as this peacemaker and this broker in, you know, what is this international order going to look like after the Great War that he wants to be seen in Europe. Um, and so we begin to start to see this pattern of presidents going abroad to advance a particular foreign policy objective, also to elevate their own image on the global stage. Um, then we also know famously, you know, that FDR is flying to various secret conferences during World War II. Um, he he gets on his plane and goes places, and then we we don't know that he's been there until he returns back to the United States, obviously in wartime. But it's really not until the Cold War that you see this decision to travel abroad. It becomes what I argue is a rhetorical strategy that a president and their advisors decide this is a moment where the president needs to go global, to travel beyond the borders of the nation. And yes, to deliver a speech, but also to see and be seen in this particular region and in so doing, communicate a particular rhetorical objective that is going to benefit the United States 
in this Cold War contest. So, so why is it the Cold War or even in a kind of um, prototypical way, Teddy Roosevelt's visit to the Panama Canal Zone, why is it those moments where presidents decide to travel? Why didn't they travel beforehand? Was it a simple issue of it was really hard to get around? Uh, there's no satellite coverage, so there's no value to be had, or is there something else at play? Why aren't presidents traveling in the, in the 19th century? Well, what's interesting, I mean, yes, obviously the limits of transportation technology, et cetera. Um, part of it is, is there is this unspoken, um, I wouldn't say agreement. There's this unspoken rule that presidents don't leave U S borders. And part of this goes all the way back to Washington and Jefferson, who are going to talk about that we need to avoid entangling alliances, um, that we need to be focused on domestic concerns. And so really this belief that goes all the way back to Washington, that if we are going to be concerned with our own issues, our internal affairs, um, we need to be here at home. And in fact, this idea of, you know, being especially involved with European monarchies, European governments, that they're going to pollute the purity of the American experiment, right? Because it is is seen as something that we were attempting to escape from after the Revolutionary War. So that would be this historical precedent of why we don't do it. And in fact, um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt will, will make some comment of saying, you know, I'm going to be breaking this ironclad custom that has governed people's decisions of will you or will you not travel? Various presidents get invitations to travel to Canada, and but it's seen as too scandalous. Um, but it also, I will say that beginning with Roosevelt on, we see this happen in moments when presidents want to make a very particular argument for U.S. foreign policy purposes that they believe the best way to make this argument is to go there themselves. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned, for example, Teddy Roosevelt going to the Panama Canal Zone. It is during a moment where there is massive public concern over the project, whether it is sanit sanitary conditions, lots of individual workers getting sick, um, you know, the, the fact that the Panama Canal has failed under previous governments that have tried to make it happen. And Roosevelt is so convinced of the project's significance um, to the United States, both politically and also as a foreign policy objective that he decides to go there himself to prove um, that he can go there, he's not going to get sick, he comes back in one piece, and to show the public why it's so important. Um, and so then as you begin, to tra you begin to trace this practice, you really see that presidents are going to make these various diplomatic trips when it is going to be perhaps one of the most persuasive ways that they can accomplish helping the public see this this scene, the situation, but also to symbolize that this place matters for U.S. foreign policy. So uh, something tells me Teddy Roosevelt would have fit right in in the Cold War. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> based on this, this, this kind of conversation here, why don't we f jump forward again and, and let's go back to this Cold War. Uh, that's the focus of your book. And give me a little bit of the lineage of this kind of Cold War rhetorical presidency, this global rhetorical presidency that unfolds during the course of the Cold War and then stays with us afterwards, um, since I don't foresee any president not traveling beyond the borders of the United States and certainly an invitation from uh, the Canadian prime minister. I, w I wouldn't believe to be scandalous anymore, but um, give me a little bit of this lineage uh, of the of the Cold War presidency on the global stage, yeah. So I, I the book the book begins um, with my examination of um, Harry S. Truman and his visit to Potsdam in 1945, specifically July and August. And astute historical listeners of your podcast will say, "Well, wait a second. We're we're not quite in the Cold War. We're still actually in World War II." You are correct. Uh, but the reason that I start the book in that place is because one of the arguments that I make is that when presidents go abroad, when they go global, it is an opportunity for them to exert their own influence on the global stage. And by that, I mean to act as the president, mm -hmm. to see and be seen as the leader. At, and this would be a phrase that would, you know, a common refrain, we still hear it today, but to be seen as the leader of the free world. And that's a phrase that arises um, initially with FDR, but really mostly with, with Truman on. Um, and so I start the book with Truman's visit to Potsdam in July and August of 1945, because it's the first 
moment that Truman is traveling abroad and really seeking to step into FDR's shadow, this large void that has been left by FDR's untimely death to many you know, it's seeming very sudden. We now know from historians that, you know, more people were aware of it than initially let on, but to the to the mass public and especially a global audience, it's this huge blow. And so, it, you know, people in the State Department, um, various White House officials write in their memoirs how terrified they are that FDR has died at this moment of grave importance um, just before German, Germany's surrender, um, then thinking about the post-war order, what does this look like? Um, the, the big three alliance between FDR, Stalin, and Churchill all of a sudden has one member missing. And so for Truman, it really is um, a test of very high stakes to see if he is really up to the challenge. And so through that um, that analysis of Truman's Truman's visit to Potsdam, I talk about how the media coverage and also Truman's own actions at this big three conference really offer him the opportunity to act as president on the world stage in a way that he has not been able to do so um, before. But we also see through this moment at Potsdam, the beginnings of this constitution of Berlin and particularly West Berlin is this really important site um, of, of democracy that will come to figure on later in the Cold War as we think about the Berlin, Berlin airlift mm -hmm. under Truman. And then, of course, also the Berlin Wall um, and then Kennedy's, um, Kennedy's speech in West Berlin. And then finally, you know, getting all the all the way to, to President Reagan um, and his famous declaration and Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. Uh, you know, and you really opened well with Truman with a with a uh, ringing an endorsement from Richard Nixon, which isn't exactly the the person that I would most think uh, is likely to give Truman a, an endorsement of his world leadership. But um, it it just goes to show the the kind of interesting little nuggets you can find when you research the historical record. So Truman, Truman maybe gives birth to the global rhetorical presidency, but you 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 kind of lay out that Dwight Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon himself, they all kind of run with this in different ways. Um, do you want to share a little kind of insight onto how they they put their own stamp on the global rhetorical presidency? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I would say that the probably the global rhetorical presidency probably has its origination as we go back to, to Teddy Roosevelt, but in terms of a Cold War context and how it quickly cycles and almost develops a life of its own, you see it with Truman. But I would argue that Eisenhower is perhaps the president who breathes into this practice its Cold War character. And by that, I mean that it is Eisenhower, and we know this about Eisenhower from you know so many great um, historians who have done some really remarkable work. Um, I drew heavily on the work of um, William Hitchcock, who wrote *Age of Eisenhower*, for example. Um, but but we know that Eisenhower, in so many ways, was responsible for so much of the behind-the-scenes diplomatic, psychological operations, kind of backstory of so much of U.S. messaging during the Cold War. Um, and we should not be surprised then that he also plays a really specific role in the rise of the global rhetorical presidency. So it's this is one of those archival finds that I just love as a historian. Um, but there is this memo that James Hagerty wrote to Eisenhower um, just after the 1958 elections, um, congressional elections in which um, Republicans, you know, had been defeated pretty soundly. Um, and Hagerty writes this memo where he essentially says to Eisenhower, I've been thinking a lot about the elections. I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do to make sure that you're not a lame duck over the next two years. And I'm also really concerned about various members of Congress, particular sen particularly senators, and he names, for example, Albert Gore, Lyndon Johnson, and these senators who believe that they have the prerogative to speak for the United States in matters of foreign policy. Um, and this is almost a direct quote, but it, that is the job of the US president. And so you need to strike them down and strike them down hard. End of the almost verbatim quote. And so then Hegarty goes on to say, you know, what I think we really should do is actually exert your power in foreign affairs through presidential travel. And these are the various places that I think you should go. 
And you should, you're, you're very popular based upon your involvement in um, World War II and you're seeing as this leader for peace. And so let's utilize that to reassert the role of president um, on the world stage. And that's written in 1958. Eisenhower would go on in 1959 and 1960 to um, visit every nation or region on the list that Hagerty gave him, with the exception of the Soviet Union, which was planned, but after the downing of the U-2 spy plane and a, a botched um, summit, that doesn't happen. And also with the exception of Japan, which Eisenhower is prevented um, from going to based upon unrest and protests in the region. And so Eisenhower, you know, on, on the surface, you see these very measured um, public statements. You know, I'm just here as a model of diplomacy. But if you look in the archives, State Department records, CIA documents, et cetera, it's very clear that there is a, a clear rhetorical purpose, which is to elevate the image of the United States on the world stage in opposition to the Soviet Union. And in fact, there's real concern after Khrushchev's 1959 tour of the United States in September um, that he's seen as too popular. He's allowed to address the U.S. public over live television. Um, and so the CIA sends a report and says, we're concerned about this. What are you going to do? And so it really is projected as this, this dueling contest between two um, leaders of the United States and the Soviet Union. It's, it's a popularity contest is what one New York Times reporter calls it. And so Eisenhower, when he leaves office, there's a number of reports um, that his office puts together in terms of these, you know, behind the scenes propaganda um, operations. And they recommend to the Kennedy administration, you know, we think you should continue this practice of traveling abroad because it's highly effective. Um, and we found it really successful. And he does. Right. And, and, and Kennedy's pretty well remembered for being uh, one to have a way with the camera, one to have a way with words, um, certainly some high profile visits to places yes. abroad. Yes. So tell, yes. tell us about Kennedy before we get into to our man, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. So, so Kennedy, um, I, in the book, I talk about how he, um, visits West Berlin and delivers that famous line, ich bin ein Berliner, which is not him saying that he's a jelly donut. Um, I'm happy to go into the German transliteration, but, um, but no, he's saying, I identify as one of you. I see myself as part of you Berliners in this, um, this cold war struggle bet between freedom and democracy. Um, and, and really, designates this place as symbolic and iconic for this this cold war crisis something that that reagan will return to um a few decades later and then the final case study in the book um after kennedy's i talk about uh, richard nixon and his opening to china and why that is so significant 1971 1972 um how it really does open up um the uh the country, both to the U.S. public, but also provides this opportunity for Nixon to really present himself as a world statesman going into the 1972 um, presidential election. Now, this gives us a good uh, kind of setup for our uh, 40th president. And there's someone that you quote um, who often does a good job of setting up the 40th president uh, over the course of her career, Peggy Noonan. Uh, friend of a good friend of, of, of the foundation and Institute uh, recalled speaking about the, the address at point to Hawk. Our goal was for American teenagers to stop chewing their rice Krispies for a minute and hear about the greatness of those kids who are now their grandfathers. Pause, sink in, bring it back to now history is real. So clearly that happened for you. I don't know if you were eating a rice yeah. crispy at the time when you heard the address. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. I hope I was. It would be very poetic. Some some tasty snack, I'm sure. Um, but Point to Hawk seems to have that effect. And you tell us why it has that effect. But even before you tell us that, um, you could give me a little sense of it how Reagan developed his rhetorical mm. skills. We know him as the great communicator, perhaps the most effective rhetorical president um, in the modern age. Those skills maybe were a bit natural, but certainly they were honed over many years. How, how did he get there? What was the roadmap for his rhetorical presidency? Yeah, it, uh, it's a great question. So I would say a number of things. I mean, obviously, um, Reagan's career prior to his time as a politician, you know, the the metaphor of the stage I use quite 
deliberately in the book, um, both in the title and throughout the text and thinking about, you know, when presidents speak, they are always on a stage and it's a stage that they construct and constitute through various means. But so I think Reagan's experience of being an actor on a Hollywood stage or on that kind of entertainment stage is going to really well prepare him. Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, what's the line? It's Reagan says something to the effect of all those who are criticizing him as an actor in the office. He's, I don't know how anyone could be a president without having been. An absolutely. Actor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And it's, yeah, they are always on a stage. Um, and so ha having that understanding of it, right. And recognizing that you are on the world's biggest stage. Um, I also think that Reagan had a unique ability. And I think, you know, both he personally and also the various people who wrote speeches for him um, to, to crystallize complex ideas into language that was memorable, that was relatable to an audience that could communicate um, shared truths or narratives about the world and, and package it and present it in a way that the audience, whether they might be you know, another head of state or ordinary Americans could see themselves in and could identify with. So, you know, the, his speech at Point to Hawk is not his only memorable address. There are a number of them. Um, I would say prior to, to 1984, there are really two that stand out um, as president. One of them, um, and we see actually in in both these speeches, they they give us insight into what he's going to do at Point to Hawk. So the first is that his um his address at Wentz Westminster um in in 1982 and how he um delivers this this speech to members of the British Parliament. Um, he utters a very clear denunciation of Soviet communism. He talks about this shared struggle that the, the United States and Great Britain. Um, share in thinking about protecting and defending democracy. And he also harnesses this previous uh, World War II alliance and says it needs to extend to the Cold War moment. Um, so that's one of the, the first ones. The second one would be um, his first State of the Union address in 1982 as well. Um, and one of the things that's so memorable about that speech that we take for granted today is that Reagan is the one that inaugurates the tradition of guests being seated in the first lady's box in the balcony um, in an address to a joint session of Congress today, it's routine. And in fact, that practice has mushroomed to include you know, over 20 people, right. but Reagan is the one that does that in 1982. And he does it by featuring Lenny Skutnik, who is this government worker who was driving home from work and sees this airplane crash into the Potomac dives in and rescues a woman whose husband and infant son die. And Reagan elevates Skutnik and, and features him in the State of the Union address as an exemplar of what he's talking about. And so both in this sense of shared commemoration, but also elevating ordinary individuals and their bodies, their physical presence, that becomes a hallmark of Reagan's rhetorical style. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the other thing you kind of hint at, too, and then the Skutnik uh, Discussion is great, especially since we just saw how many guests at the State of the Union. Um, yeah. but the other thing you also talk about is uh, Reagan's ability to kind of deal with the vocabulary of the Cold War, to effectively use the vocabulary of the Cold War. You call the Cold War um, this kind of mythic narrative that was made uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you mean when you say the Cold War was uh, mythic? Um, not necessarily myth, but mythic. Correct. Correct. Yes. So I, I I use the term mythic deliberately, and this is drawing on um, you know a number of academic articles and thinkers and writers. But essentially, what I mean by that is this idea that myth is another way, I'm not describing a fable or folklore, but I'm talking about a way that individuals use language to create and invite members of the audience to join in a larger narrative arc or story in which they can see themselves in. So when we think about the various mythic qualities of the Cold War, here I'm thinking about this this bipolar confrontation that's often described in terms of 
light and dark or good and evil. Thinking about it as a, a contest between two superpowers that there is, you know, these very clear sides um, that 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 dominate um, this contest. And, and I think for Reagan, you know, one of the things that he contributes to to this this mythic narrative is that there was a particular way to respond to the expanse of the Soviet Union and to counter Soviet advance in various spaces and spheres of the globe and to link the United States role in the Cold War to previous shared struggles. And what he does is link that to World War II. So we see him do that at Point of Hawk, but he does it all over his rhetoric, is talking about how just as we had this very clear adversary in World War II fighting against Nazi Germany, the the degrading, inhumane treatment of um, various groups of people, including the including the Jewish people, um, in that particular moment, the we can look back and we can see how wrong um, and and inhumane that was. And so Reagan would remind his audience of these shared values, this shared struggle, and then linked it to the current Cold War crisis and said, we need to do the same thing in this moment, just as we did in the past. We need to do it in the present. And you point out that reminding his audience is a very important thing, as we heard from Peggy Noonan. There, there's a whole set of teenagers that the Reagan administration is trying to reach to remind them of decisive moral U.S. action. I think you say something to the effect of World War II was the point where U.S. power and U.S. morality were most closely aligned. Reagan's trying to, to do that in the 1980s, right? And that's the, the kind of context you're hitting upon, um, is that generational tension. Maybe you can, maybe we should get into Point to Hawk now and give us the... Yeah. The context of why Reagan's traveling to Normandy to give this speech, why he needs to give this speech. I mean, I imagine there's a personal side of it, but why it's important to him in that moment. Um, yeah, walk us through it. Yeah, so it's a it's a commemorative address. It's a moment in which Reagan, it's the 40th anniversary of D-Day, so it's obviously a, a major anniversary. Um, Reagan decides to travel there along with visits to a number of other stops in Europe. Um, but if you look at the archival records of the White House speech writing office, pa papers of Peggy Noonan, as you brought up, that I drew heavily upon um, in various State Department memos and National Security Administration memos, um, by and large, all his advisors agree that the speech at Point Hawk is going to be the most important address of the trip. And the reason for that is that Reagan's advisors really plan the trip around this commemorative event, not only because it is this this marker, this this historical marker for um, a, a U.S. audience who will be watching at home, but also because Reagan is going into the 1984 presidential election. And one of the things that, that various Reagan advisors note is that they want to make sure that they are presenting him as a global leader on this world stage going into 1984. And there are various um various public uh, poll public polling memorandums, et cetera, that that indicate that there could be some weakness there. Um, there's there's one poll that that Mike Deaver draws on who says, you know, if anything, the the place of weakness that we need to be aware of in 1984 is Reagan's image as a world leader. And so what are we going to do to counteract that? So the the trip in April 1984 to China is a part of that initiative. And then this, this trip to Normandy um, in 1984 is also a part of that initiative. But when Reagan goes to Point to Hawk, I think it's important and significant for people to remember that this actually is an event that is designed for a small group of people. It's televised nationally and internationally. So the White House times the address so that it coincides with the morning news cycle. So they want, as Peggy Noonan talks about, teenagers eating their Rice Krispies. Well, teenagers eat their Rice Krispies at about 810 because Reagan is speaking at about 210 um, in Normandy. And they designed the day around this because they are so intent on wanting a U.S. audience to pause sit back, let history sink in and see that it's real. The other thing to remember too, is if you're a teenager in 1984, the most recent historical conflict or war that you could remember would be Vietnam. 
And throughout the speech, Reagan is making a very intensive effort to portray the rightness of U.S. military action in a place and in a moment and against a foe that is really not debatable. You can't say the same about Vietnam for many people, right? Or at least this this concern over, okay, what does U.S. intervention abroad really look like? And is it always good? And what are the questions that we have about it? Um, That's more difficult to talk about when it comes to Vietnam versus Normandy. So when Reagan finally delivers this speech, um, it's also quite significant that it's being watched over live television, because if you've seen images of the speech, again, highly recommend that your viewers um, look up a video. You can just on YouTube, the Reagan Foundation has it. It's great. Um, But it, it, it is situated so that Reagan is speaking and there is a horseshoe formation on either side of him, which is composed of 62 U.S. Army Rangers. And these are the actual embodied physical presence of these men who climb the cliffs behind him. So Reagan is speaking atop these hundred foot cliffs um, that if you look over them, it's very easy. I've been there. It's very easy. You could just fall over them because there's really not any um, guardrails or anything. But these are the men that climbed these hundred foot cliffs under German enemy fire. um, And they were sent there ahead of the the major advances on D-Day to take out what they thought were the German artillery situated on the top of these cliffs. Because if you can imagine looking over to the out over the English channel, um, if they were successful, they could take out all the ships on D-Day. So 225 U.S. Army Rangers trained for this moment. They climb these cliffs. There's a line in the speech where Reagan talks about after um, two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. And 62 of the survivors were present at this speech. And so Reagan in the address both narrates what happened on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944. That's how he starts the speech. Um, And multiple times throughout the address, he points his audience to the men assembled in front of them. And he uses their physical presence as evidence for his larger argument about what D-Day meant, about what their sacrifice meant, and then saying, we need to take the same um, risks, the same, demonstrate the same moral resolve now in the Cold War as we did 40 years ago. So this is really an inflection in how presidents operate rhetorically, is what you're telling me. When I think about Point de Hoc, and I also think about State of the Union and and Skutnik, Reagan is pointing out, literally pointing out, the heroism of everyday Americans in a way that presidents before him hadn't. That is correct. To drive home a, a larger political and moral message about U.S. leadership in the world. Yes. Or U.S. uh, civic ideals at home, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, That's kind of fascinating because for anyone who looks at presidents' addresses, State of the Unions, press conferences to say, it seems like they're always pointing someone else, maybe as a way to deflect attention on themselves. But it's it seems like this kind of classic rhetorical strategy that's been around forever. Um, And that might be a good point. For you to tell me, tell our listeners, what's the what's the reaction to Point to Hawk? I mean, what's the legacy that it leaves? It, it's not just this kind of one-off thing that people forget about, right? I mean, something happens. Absolutely. And it's, you know, oftentimes when when people talk about it, the speech that is either, you know, a reaction to the speech as one initial moment, or also in conjunction with the the remarks, the later remarks that Reagan will give that day um, at the the American Military Seminary cemetery. Um, and he will um, talk about the the actions of um, Private Zanetta, who was someone who fought on D-Day, um, sent a letter to his daughter. His daughter wrote the president this, this letter about how she wanted to go back to the beaches and see where her father um, sacrificed so much. And so oftentimes we also hear about that speech in conjunction with the Point to Hawk speech. But it's wildly successful. Um, in fact, Mike Deaver takes the footage um, of Point to Hawk, uh, the, the Omaha Beach speech, um, Reagan's trip both to, to China and to, to Europe. And it becomes a key part of the messaging of the 1984 presidential campaign. Um, we see it in the, the Morning in America film that is showed at the 1984 Republican National Convention. It's also the case that there have been moments at later Republican National Conventions where there have been various tributes to President Reagan that, that um, clips of this speech will be replayed. 
And so it has come to represent, I think, one of the things that Reagan did as president from a rhetorical perspective, and you just identified it, right, with, is being able to point out or display, show forth various people, places, events that have come to symbolize some aspect of national identity or character. You think about it in terms of pointing to individuals in the, the balcony of the State of the Union. You think about it in terms of Point to Hawk. We think about one of the President President Reagan's most memorable lines, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. His innate understanding of it's a pretty simple line to utter, and it's something that he does, and a lot of people tell him to not to do it, and he does it anyway. And yet that sticks with us because it is this memorable physical marker that symbolizes something much broader. And yet to a an ordinary public, they can remember it, they can see it, and they can see that something's wrong with it in the case of the Berlin Wall. Mm, so there, there's a lot of witness and call to action. And yeah, it's um, it's really remarkable how you've kind of laid these points out in, in Reagan's rhetoric. Um, you've done such a good job of kind of explaining to us that Reagan uses place to really drive home a message, but that doesn't mean place dictates message, it seems. You point out that um, almost every president since Reagan has now gone to Normandy to give a speech, something I, I knew about Reagan's speech at Normandy, and I maybe knew about one or two others, but so clearly some are more memorable than others, but can, can, can you tell me how that tradition has now evolved and what What's the same? What's different? Yeah. So I think, um, yes, it has become uh, a standard of presidential speech making. Now, obviously, not all presidents can choose where their terms fall in terms of a big anniversary or not. Um, but um, when presidents go there, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I've read all the speeches that have been delivered at Normandy since Reagan. And there are always glimmers or hints of attempts to emulate in some way, shape or form what he did at Normandy. A lot of that you'll sometimes have, um, for example, when Trump spoke most recently at Normandy, he was referring to, to members of you know the few survivors that were left that were here and they were an example of patriotism and commitment, for example. Um, there's you know the example of, um, Barack Obama, who is greeting U.S. Army Rangers at Normandy. They weren't the ones that fought at Normandy, but they're currently serving in the U.S. military, right? So that that tradition continues. Um, but I think, you know, all presidents now face the challenge of explaining to today's teenager to stop eating the Rice Krispies and understand that history is real. You know, for Reagan, it was 40 years ago. We're coming up on the 80th anniversary. And so um, as you attempt to explain the meaning of D-Day within a much larger globalized society where you know, many other wars since World War II, um, but that does still matter. And how do you connect the past with the present? I think it's not as easy to display the 62 U.S. Army Rangers that are right there that you can see um, their their bodies withered with age um, and, and yet they're there to bear witness it's not as easy anymore. Um, but I would also argue that, that that's one of a president's most important tasks is to find ways to help the public remember together and to take stock of where we have been and where we are going. Um, so it remains to be seen, you know, next year will be the 80th anniversary and it'll be interesting to see what Biden decides to do and, you know, how other political officials mark the moment. Um, but I think it's, it's a really important one. Well, I think there's a couple of things I want to ask you. And um, one on kind of does travel to define the geographic boundaries, if you will, of, of the reach of American freedom or the reach of American um, foreign policy aims, is that still solely the reserve for American presidents? And I, I have a few recent examples in mind. Uh, we've, of course, had two congressmen who went over to Afghanistan to observe how the evacuation was proceeding. But I think the, the one that sticks out in all of our minds recently is Nancy Pelosi's visit 
Taiwan. Does this idea now have broader purchase beyond the executive branch? It does. Um, you, you know, you mentioned the example of Nancy Pelosi and her trip to Taiwan last summer. You know, the thing that's really interesting about that example is the Biden and the Biden administration refused to comment on it. Um, and th th I have a number of theories about why they chose to do that. And who knows what's going on behind the scenes, right? But, but the decision to land a U.S governmental plane on the island of Taiwan is a huge step. And, and notice that, that we don't really care about what she said. It's the fact that she was there physically and that, as you noted, the boundaries of U.S. influence have extended to Taiwan because the plane chose to, to land there. Um, you think about, you know, congressional sightseeing trips, whether it's Afghanistan, other places in the world. You think about um, Donald Trump's decision to step across the boundary line between North and South Korea, right? Um, but but all of these are examples or moments in which what was assumed to be almost off limits or a place that we shouldn't go, perhaps a way to put a proverbial toe in the water hmm. is to go there physically before you advance a particular foreign policy objective. Um, I also think in the example of Pelosi or other members of Congress, I'll take us all the way back to Eisenhower and Hagerty's memo saying, you know, members of Congress think that this is their prerogative to, to enact the foreign policy of the United States, but it's the president's prerogative and his alone. Um, in fact, in the U.S. Constitution, right, it's it's um, it's the Senate who can make treaties, for examples, and uh, the the person of the president has really evolved to have foreign policy powers in a way that that are actually not constitutionally mandated. Um, so you can see a scenario in which a member of Congress, if they're trying to get um, some some political points could start traveling around just because they can, and because they are a U.S. governmental official, it's going to feel as if. The, you know, the, the image of the nation is being extended, even if they're not speaking as president. All right. Well, I think this is a good place to, to fall into old routines and old habits and ask, ask you, Allison, what is your favorite Reagan quote? But a little flair for this episode. Also, what is your favorite Reagan presidential trip? Favorite Reagan quote and favorite presidential trip. Well, I'll be a little boring, but I'll tell you why. Um, I'm going to say my favorite quote is a line from the speech that we've been talking about, um, where he says, these are the boys of Point de Hook. And the reason for that is because that is a line that as a teenager, I remembered that if I was eating my Rice Krispies, um, it caused me to stop and to wonder who these boys were and, and where they were and what they did. Um, and I think it's emblematic of, of one of um, Reagan's rhetorical his style, his skill. The trip I'm going to say is the Point of Hawk trip. And this is why it was 10 years ago, almost to the month that I started my archival research on this speech, this project, and now the book is out. Um, and when I was doing field work in Normandy, and I was there with my son, who at the time was three. And I remember now, if you go to Normandy, if you've been there, or Omaha Beach, you can walk down on the beach and there were families having picnics and playing in the ocean. And I remember standing there and not knowing what to do with this site that is so sacred, that saw so much bloodshed, and that there were families having a picnic on the beach. And then my son, who had never been to the ocean, asked if he could run into the water. And I, I didn't know what to say. And then I realized, you know what, I think what, what Reagan was trying to do in that speech, and those who fought and died on those beaches were doing it so that we now today can use that space and be in that space and to do it in their memory and their own, but also have the freedom to do it. Um, and so for me, that trip and that quote really crystallizes a lot of what I'm trying to get at in this book. Um, and I think it also helps us think about the role of presidential speech in, in commemoration and, and reminding us um, of these shared values. Well, I will say that is um, not only a rigging endorsement of Reagan's message, but also a good reason to, if you're ever traveling to Normandy, to first buy The World is Our Stage, 
by Dr. Allison Prash. Dr. Prash, thank you so much for joining us today on Reaganism. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend. Thank you.